everyone on the live and those on the live feed. A little girl became restless as the preacher's sermon dragged on and on and on. Finally, she leaned over to her mother and whispered, Mommy, if we give him the money now, will he let us go? <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. No fly or junior Lutheran uh, youth group tonight. And anybody wanting to help with the Vacation Bible School, there's a sign up on the bulletin board for snacks or just help. And also we need housing for the group that's coming. So uh, if you have any other questions, ask uh, Vacation Bible School Superintendent sitting back there. <laughs> Christy, if she would, uh, if you need any help with uh, finding out what they need. And the quarterly meeting is after the service today. It should be short, so don't everybody run out the door. So it, uh, we have a big vote on the amendment, which will finalize it. So uh, right after the service today in the parish hall. Pastor. Good morning. So I do have one announcement. I received a, a call from Viola List's uh, daughter yesterday, and she just was informing me a little bit of how she was doing, but she was also informing me of the address and which, where she's at right now. She's at uh, Heritage Health currently as she goes through rehab. Um, currently, she can't walk on her own yet still after her surgery from when she broke her hip. Um, she can, they make her get up and walk around four times a day, and she does fairly well, but she, can't, she still can't walk on her own. She still has to be assisted yet. Um, her 94th birthday is coming up on May 3rd, and so she wanted to let us know where she's at because there were some of you who did send some get well cards, and that was all much appreciated for her, but they went to her old um, home, and, and so then they had to move them and make sure they got all of her mail moved and all that kind of stuff. So if you would like to send birthday well wishes and things like that, which I think uh, would be a great idea, even if you wanted to put a note in there of a get well as well still, um, make sure that you send it to Heritage Health, please, and, and continue to be in prayer for her as she's continuing to heal. Um, she did say that uh, they got her some Easter um, cards and some of them had some verses on them. And she said if they started the verse, she was able to finish. Every single one of those verses she was able to finish, which is pretty amazing. And then uh, her family were out here that uh, were from Florida, and there was a cake there. And she said, well, who, they asked, who brought you the cake? And she said, Bob Boer. <laughs> So Bob, so at some point in time, you made some kind of impression, and so she remembers Cake and Bob Boer together. So, so keep her in prayers, and uh, we're thankful for uh, her recovery. So, uh, Are there any other announcements that need to be made that have not been made? All right. We begin our service this morning then in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our call to worship is Psalm 33. So you're welcome to turn there or follow along. Uh, I'll read from the Pew Bible. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, and make melody to him with the harp of the ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathered the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. If you ever get an opportunity, I'm going to stop for a moment. If you ever get an opportunity to read Martin Luther's works on Genesis... It's really amazing. And one of the things that I'll never forget that Martin Luther talks about there about God is that when, G when God speaks, it is, right? 
So when God says son, there's a son. And so uh, the, um, the amazing power of God in creation is fantastic. So the Lord brings the counsel, uh, verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart are to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army, a warrior not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great mighty it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Let us open in prayer. Let our hope be in you, Lord. And as we've gathered today here in your presence, we ask that you would fill this place with your spirit. May it move mightily among us. And may your word come forth and penetrate our hearts, Lord. May we be strengthened and our souls encouraged and established, Lord, by your word and spirit. May your glory be lifted above all. And may you be set on high as we praise your holy name today. Hear our prayer and praise to you, for you are an awesome God and worthy of all of it. In your holy name, amen. Let's join together in our opening hymn, hymn number 526, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. You, you make my heart glad. Receive now the declaration of grace and absolution. If this be your sincere confession, and if with penitent hearts you earnestly desire the forgiveness of your sin for the sake of Jesus Christ, God, according to his promise, forgives you all your sins. Forgives you all your sins. And by the authority of God's word and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I can declare to you that God, through His grace, has forgiven all your sins. In the name of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the scripture reader at this time. The Old Testament lesson comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and sat me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around, around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I was prophesied as I, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So, prophet, so I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, <clears throat> Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. Therefore, prophecy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you 
and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. New Testament lesson comes from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 10. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. Here ends the reading. You are all aware that I grew up in a home that wasn't Christian and, and it didn't have Christian values. And we watched all kind of crazy movies when I was a kid, and I'm still kind of a horror fanatic even today. But when I was young, I always wondered, where, where did the idea of skeletons come from that would walk around and try to scare people, right, in the movies? Kind of an interesting thought that... Somebody took something from Scripture to try to use it to scare people, when in reality, the thought of a skeleton getting up and walking around actually is talking about life in Christ. Next time you see a skeleton, think of that, life in Christ. The gospel text today comes from John chapter 20. It's verses 1 through 18. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? Is it different on the board? Twenty. Okay, so don't follow the board. <laughs> I'll read what I have here, and then, and then afterwards, maybe we'll read that too, because that's 19 through 31, so we could maybe just keep going. Maybe we'll just read all of John today. No. Okay, chapter 20, verse 1 through 18. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Yeah, that's right. Doors locked. No way in. Jesus got in. And he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he, breath, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness of from any, it is withheld. This is the basis of absolution, as I say it, not in my words, but in his. Not in my works, but in his. Now Thomas, is one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, and when he had seen the Lord, but he had said to them, unless I see his hands and the mark of his nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I, I will never believe. Eight days later, <laughs> his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he has said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And then Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have never seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these 
are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Here ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Oh, wait, no, don't sit yet. Well, we'll continue our service with our confession of faith. Let us conf confess our holy faith then in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. All right. Does anybody think they've got them all? So those are the people that I know not to pick on. We want to pick on somebody who doesn't know, right? That's unfair. Unfair. Doug, why are you shaking your head? You're like, you're supposed to stay perfectly still so I don't see you and pick you out of the crowd. Right? I remember my teacher would call, get ready to call on somebody. I'd just be kind of like, look over in a corner, try not to make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. No, no. All right, let's see. Hey, Bob, do you think you got it? No? Does your, is, you'll, you'll need a little help? Okay, let's try it. A, B, C, can. D? Dig. A, B, C, D. E? F? H? I? Did I forget G? G? H? G? G, H? I, J, K? No. Jehoshaphat? J, okay. H, I, J, K? Kapow. H, I, J, K, L? M? That was last week, mice. Sorry, Bob. I, I butchered it worse than you did. So, yeah, I, I have, I, I, that's, how, that's how my brain works, right? I have to, like, say it in order in order just to remember where I'm at. So today we're on N. We're on N. N is one of my favorites. Noah? Nope, not Noah, though that would be good. And if I was going to do Noah, what, what, what possibly could I make connection with, Weston? Why could I do that? And where does it, in Scripture, where does it say that? Come on, you can get it. First Peter chapter. Just get, just get the chapter. Three, chapter three. And what does it say there? It says what? Baptism what? Baptism now saves. Right in Scripture, right there, it says baptism that now saves you. It says it corresponds to what? Um, Noah. Noah. Noah, okay, all right. So, but that's not what we're doing. You just got a whole lesson. You got a bonus lesson. <laughs> Yay, bonus lessons. Okay, so we're going to do new. New. And we're going to talk about baptism. 
Guess why? Okay, so it says this, that when we go into baptism, that we are buried with Christ in baptism. And that when we come out of the waters of baptism, that we rise in newness of life. So new for what? New what? What did I say? Yeah, new life. So does that mean that we're like, like all of a sudden, like, you know, new skin and new hair? No. No. So what's it talking about? Is it talking about physical life or something else? Well, what's that something else? Well, come on, you're killing me. So, okay. Hey. What kind of life is it? Say, life of my soul. Life of your soul? Way to go. You got it right. It's talking about new life in our soul, right? So why do we need new life in our soul? So, do you guys remember what happened today in the scripture lesson? What did we talk about in the scripture lessons today? What were there in, in, in Ezekiel? What was it? It was a valley full of what? Skeleton. Full of, yeah, dry bones, right? Anybody like dry bones? You guys, you guys ever seen, you ever go outside and you find like a, a skeleton of an animal that had died? Have you guys ever found that before? Yeah. Under the porch. Under the porch. What you guys been hiding under the porch at the par parsonage? <laughs> Old pastors, you guys uh, get rid of? <laughs> oh, we don't know where that pastor went. <laughs> so these dry bones, what happens in the story? What happens in, and this isn't just like a fake story. This, this took place. So God takes Ezekiel out there and he says what to him? He says, he asks him, do you think that these bones can come alive? And what does Ezekiel say? He says, Lord, you know. Like, he's like, well, I'm not quite sure if they can or not. But, but if they could, you know if they can or not. And so then God says what to him? What does he say to speak over them? He says, he tells them, command them to come alive. Right? To the special what? Cans? So he talks about it and he says, tell them to come alive. And then all of a sudden, what happens? They come together and they stand up. And then do they walk around like skeletons or what happens to him? Nope. It says that the flesh builds up onto him and then they become a great army. So, Because Jesus, this is a story about Jesus making people to come alive, Right? And they were, maybe. But then what happens? So if we're buried with him in his baptism, when we come out, we have newness of life. Do you guys see the connection, right? So dead bones come alive. Baptism, baptism death to life. Okay? So what do we do if we need new life? Now, all of you, raise your hand if you guys were all baptized. Yeah, you guys were all baptized, right? So you guys have new life. But there are going to be people that maybe you don't know that they need new life. What are we going to do with them? What are we going to do? Because there's power in the, in the what? Faith comes by... No, this is a verse. What does it say? Faith comes by... Yes, it does. But faith comes by hearing... And hearing by the word. That's right. So are we going to come across people maybe who haven't been baptized and who don't believe in Jesus? Yeah. And do we want them to have new life? Yeah. So what are we going to do to help them? Because we received new life because of baptism, which is connected with the word of God, which provides for us faith. What are we going to do for other people then? We're going to teach them in the word. That's right. Good idea. So what's N for? New. new. For new what? Life. life. And that life is in what? Now, well, there is from baptism, but you said earlier, you're like, in Jesus. Now is the time you'd say Jesus. In what? Jesus. In Jesus. Okay, ready? Arms out. 
When we, when we get our hands together, we're going to say new life in Jesus. Ready? Together. New life in Jesus. Oh, man, we did that terribly. Arms out. Together. New life in Jesus. Not loud enough. Ready? Out. Together. New life in Jesus. There we go. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Lord, we're thankful for your power. And we're thankful that in you we have life. Lord, we pray that that life would grow deep within us and that it would spread out so far, Lord. May you use us to spread life to those who don't have life. May you use us to spread your word and your gospel and your love. And Lord, continue to cultivate within us faith as we continue to be devoted to your word. In your holy name, amen. Good job, guys. Go be seated. Virginia, will you pull up verse 5? This verse, of oh, this hymn, sorry. Verse 5. How many of you um, 
know people that, for an example, wait to get married till they feel like, you know, oh, we're, once we're finally financially stable, then we can, we can get married, right? I've heard of those people. And, you know, sometimes if you wait till you're financially stable just to have children, you may, be, you may never have children, right? There's always, there's always more that could be prepared for. Uh, I guess you don't know that till you have children, but the beautiful thing about the cross is that he, he takes us just as we are, right? You don't have to be something you're not. You don't have to achieve something better than what you are so that Christ will receive you. He receives you as you are. Broken and blind and wretched, right? Just as you are. What a beautiful thing to sing about. Love hymns that are rich. So thank you. Today, we're going to start a series in James. How many of you dislike James? All right. At least one of you is honest, right? So Luther didn't have a very good look on James to begin with. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here in a, in a few minutes. But we're going to start with James chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. That's our text for today. I'm going to first read it from the ESV, but I'll probably make reference also to the New American Standard. Um, but let us begin. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kind. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask that you would reveal unto us the message for today. Would you reveal unto us what you would have us hear from your word? What do you want our hearts to be encouraged by? What do you want us to be warned of? How would you want us to respond, Lord? May we see your love fully as you reveal yourself to us through your word today. In your holy name, amen. As we begin, it's important that we understand who James is, right? He's writing the book here. And so, um, anybody know of, of name, name some of the Jameses listed in Scripture? Who do we got? Anybody? Yeah, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who are also known as the sons of thunder, right? John being the disciple whom Jesus loved, who wrote the Gospel of John and First and Second, Third John and Revelation, right? So we, we kind of focused on him a little bit through Lent season as he was present during all of that period of time through the, through the cross and through the death and then after and run into the grave and uh, get in there first, but then Peter was a little more bold to jump in the dark hole and check it out. So that was John. Well, his brother's name is James. Well, James was martyred. Do you guys remember that? Early on, James is martyred. So this could not have been James, the son of Zebedee. It could not have been that James that wrote this, wrote this book because he was, he was martyred early on. So who else do we have? Who? Brother James. Yeah, Jesus' brother James. Did you know that Jesus' brother James was not a believer until after Christ's death and resurrection? Right? We find that out from John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, and Matthew chapter 12, verses 46. Those two places remind us that that his brothers did not believe. Jesus' brothers did not believe. And in fact, that one time, they, they wanted to get rid of him. They were trying to silence him. Do you guys remember that event? That's the one that happens in Matthew, I believe. However, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, we do find something. That James, the brother of Jesus, is one of the first people that Jesus reveals himself to. It says he revealed himself to James and then the other disciples. As much as I get frustrated with my brothers because they make some stupid decisions, 
I love them deeply, right? And when my one brother passed away, it, it hurt a lot. And I had so many regrets of how mean I was to him growing up. So can you imagine for a moment what it was like for James when Jesus appeared to him? After not believing and then seeing his death, maybe not even believing through that, but when he stands before you alive after clearly being dead, could you not believe? And the man who, be, who was not a believer during his ministry becomes a leader in the church. That's pretty powerful, is it not? That's like Saul, right? Who went from persecuting the church to being the main dog. So here we have James, the brother of Jesus, who is the writer of James. It's said in one of the old church fathers' writings, and it's quoted from Ebisus in church history, in his writing church history. He describes James as this. James was a Nazarite who drank no wine or strong drink, who ate no animal food, whose head was not touched by a razor. What does that tell you about James? Anybody? Anybody want to shout something out? Do you guys feel like I'm not preaching, I'm more teaching today? Well, he was definitely a vegetarian. Who else was a vegetarian would not eat me in Scripture, Old Testament? You guys make a, make a reference here? We got one over here. Who, who was it back there? Daniel. That's the one I was thinking about, but you said Samuel? Oh, I thought you said Samuel. Yeah, we got Daniel, right? Daniel challenges Nebuchadnezzar, who's trying to fatten up all of his wise people, and he's trying to give them the best food that he thought was great. And technically, it turned it was animal. And, and he was trying to give them the best to make them look the best. And Daniel says, no, you know what? If you give me only vegetables and fruits to eat, why don't you check it out? The, f the, the four of us, Meshach, uh, Abednego, and Shadrach, right? And then himself. He says, feed us just fruits and vegetables and you check us out and you see how our skin will be. And it says their skin glowed, right? So for those of you guys who are meat eaters, maybe you should stop eating meat. I don't know. I'm not going to stop eating meat. I don't like my skin to be good in complexion, right? I like, I'd rather eat meat. No. Uh, so we have James. What does it say? Because, because he was this way, a vegetarian, not eating, not drinking strong drink. What does it tell you about his lifestyle? Let's do this. I'm going to give you a hint by challenging a confirmation student. Oh, Alyssa's in the back. But she, does, she doesn't have Janaya here, so she, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip you, Alyssa, because your moral support is sitting far from you. So Weston. Nope, just kidding. I'm going to pick on Dorothy because she's smiling in the back. Dorothy, all of Scripture is broken into two things. What? Law and gospel. And law is what purpose? What does it do? It shows us our sin. Because we try to accomplish the law. It's the part of Scripture that's like, do, 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 do. And when we get into Scripture and we try to do, 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 what do we recognize? We can't, 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 right? And that we need a Savior. And so the, the purpose of the law is for us to be recognized that we need a Savior. I should be... You guys, it's been a year since you guys studied some of this stuff. Maybe I should be picking on you. That's all right. No, thanks. I'm good. Uh, I've had enough of that already today. So, sometimes what we have is that our experiences in life shape who we are and how we act, right? How many of you are old school and feel like you're probably a little bit more heavy with law, Right? that you feel like there's more things that we should be trying to do and accomplishing and fulfilling um, than, than feeling more like maybe your counterparts in the millennial generation are kind of loosey-goosey, right? Those people, you people, you people, you older people? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. 
I saw that look, right? What are you going to say? What are you, what are you going to say right now, Pastor? For you, those of you who are older, I know one thing. Your life has shaped you differently than my children. How do I know this? Because you're a lot harder working than my children are. You're harder working than I am. Our life and the experiences change us. Well, who was James? James was a Jewish person. And for a lot of his life, his life was measured on trying to fulfill the law. So after he became a believer, there's no reason why he wouldn't try to continue to follow with some of that stuff. Not that it made him right with God, but that he knew that that's something that pleased the Lord, so he's going to try to do it. So do we try to accomplish the law? Raise your hand if you feel that our job is to follow the law. And I've left that vague for a reason. Raise your hand if you think so. Raise your hand. It's okay to raise your hand and be wrong, all right? Yeah, we are to try to follow the law. But under what purpose? Under love, because the gospel has compelled us. We don't try to follow the law so that God would be happy with us as if we're going to accomplish it and make ourselves right with him, right? That's not the purpose of the law for us to complete because Christ already completed it. You guys are all following me. Maybe some of you a little less than others. Okay, why am I talking about this? It's kind of important. Because what we find when we begin to read through James is that James is heavy law. In fact, a lot of people will liken it to Proverbs of the New Testament. And that's important for us to recognize. We need to understand what the purpose of the law is. And is James saying these things for us then to try to complete them, and so by completing them, find our salvation? Is that the message of James? Because if that's the message of James, that's completely against the rest of Scripture, and therefore James should not be canonical, right? It should not be in the canon. It should not be a part of Scripture. It's important to know that. Did you know that for a long time... James was not part of the canon. Do you all understand what I mean when I say canon? I mean canon, and that's the, the word we used for the approved, inerrant scripture. It's what we currently have today, the canon. The book of the Bible that we consider inerrant, without error. Are there other pieces of scripture that are old that we have copies of that were written that are not canonical? Yeah, there are. Are the church father's writings canonical? Are they considered inerrant? No, they're not. But do we refer to them sometimes for information? Absolutely, I did this morning. Okay. It wasn't actually until the Council of Carthage in 397 A.D. that James was considered canonical. And it wasn't actually really introduced into the Eastern Church until 1627. 670 years after it was written that people start to recognize it as being canonical. All right. Well, it's written to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. What are the 12 tribes? Yeah, I see you looking over there, Dorothy, trying to... No eye contact, no eye contact. You don't have to tell me what the 12 tribes are individually, but what are the 12 tribes? Can you tell me that? She looks at her dad. Dad, save me. The Israelites, the 12 tribes of the Israelites that come out of, out of Egypt, right? And then they are separated out into the new land. They are the Hebrew people. They were separated by jaw or by uh, title, by name, and then given different areas and the Levites were considered one of them, and they didn't get any property, but they became the priests, right? Okay. In the dispersion. So what James is doing is he's writing to 
the new believers who are Jewish. Okay, Weston, are you ready? What chapter in Acts, and I'm only asking this because we just covered it, what chapter in Acts do we start to see that there are Gentiles who become believers? Because at first, the day of Pentecost, it was only Jewish people. And it was only Jewish people in believing at first until when? When did that change? Chapter what? Do you remember? Nope. Do you remember, Dorothy? Chapter what? Two is, nope, two is the day of Pentecost, because that, that was the Jewish day of Pentecost. And then remember I said, oh yeah, guys, this is kind of like the Gentile day of Pentecost, right? You guys remember that? Wayne, do you remember? Picking on Wayne. I don't know. Between, between chapter 8 and 10. All right, so my point in that is, guess what? The early believers were Jewish. They weren't Gentiles right away. It wasn't like you and I who are not Jewish became believers right away. At first it was to the Jewish people. All right. This is who James is writing to. My question then to you is, since you're Gentile, do you say, well, I have no need of James? I know you'd like to say that, Wayne, so you can excuse it and don't have to read it, but that's not the case, is it? Because we find out also from Paul that Jesus tore down the wall of separation. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, between Greek right, and Jew. We are now all of one house. So while James writes specifically to the Jewish people, we hear it today and take heart of it. Well, what are we writing and what are we hearing of to begin from James? He says... Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. You guys know this verse, right? How many of you, is this is your favorite verse? Maybe not your favorite, but you know you bring it up sometimes, right? Usually when you're angry and you want to throw a plate against the wall. Count it joy. I look at my children, count it, count it joy, count it joy. We will have various trials. If you hear a message from a pastor that tells you that you can have a life free of trials and tribulation, do not listen to them. Turn the TV off. Get up and walk out the door. No. You will have trials. They will come. In fact, Jesus says, it's going to happen more now. Why? Because they hated me. So they're going to hate you. When you become a believer, you're born newness of life out of the waters with a target on your back. Right? Satan's newest target as you come out of the waters of life. Satan doesn't need to work on the world. He's already got that under control. He's going to work on the threats. Are you a threat? I hope you're a threat. In fact, I hope you take pride in being a threat. Maybe you wake up every day and you're like, you know what? How can I threaten Satan today? I hope that's what you do. I hope you wake up and you're like, what you got today? I'm ready. I'm going to give a bow, to, I'm going to give a bow right to Satan's jaw today. I hope that as trials come your way, you recognize that sometimes we face them and the product is important. So we had these trees in our backyard in Roseau, right? They were apple trees and they were planted right before the people left. So they were probably two or three years old. And you know what happened to them? Because there was nobody on the property, the deer took over. And you know what those deer did? They chewed those trees down to a nub. So we had these wonderful two- to three-year-old apple trees in the backyard, and guess what they were good for? Nothing. No, nothing. They didn't produce any apples. They didn't do nothing because the deer pretty much had killed them off. 
To produce fruit means that the tree is healthy, right? It means it's good. Anybody here like having trees that produce nothing? How many of you have trees that produce like acorns or walnuts and you're like, I wish they didn't produce those things. <laughs> I wish they produced nothing. It says here, for you know that the testing of your faith Hold up. Okay? Because we're not talking about just any kind of trial here. Okay? I'm not talking about a trial that I'm walking in the dark and I stub my toe on a big toy that was left out, right? Does that hurt? Anybody walk on a Lego? Legos are death. And for a person who's got diabetes, who feet feel more, I, I can step on a crumb and feel like I stepped on a Lego. So when I step on a Lego... My leg, my leg literally feels like it blew up and like went over here. It hurts so bad. And a lot of times I'm holding myself back from things that I want to say in this moment of frustration and pain. Do you think that as I step on a Lego that I question my faith? Oh, Lord, are you seriously God because I stepped on a Lego? No. This scripture says that you're going to face various trials and that those trials will test your faith. It's not just going to test whether or not you're a good person and whether you're going to cuss or not or how you're going to handle tough things in life. It's saying that you're going to question your faith because it's testing it. That's a different kind of trial, is it not? This morning, Ken, I think of you. Because your trial could have easily tested your faith. But in return, instead of shaking you down, you turned to Christ and were built up, right? I've known you for only a short time, only a few years. But I see such great strength and tenderness in your faith today in compared to when I first met you. We will be tested. Our faith will be shaken. Some of me wants to ask a question, and maybe it's not right, but if you're, if you're having trials that are not testing your faith, maybe we should be asking why. Am, am I really a threat to Satan? Is he really going to question and test my faith? Or am I just another person that he's like, hey, don't worry about those guys over there. The, <clears throat> don't worry about that. This one is the one we need to worry about. I want you today in this pew, I want you to be one of those people that has said, this one, that's the one you need to worry about. This is who I want us to be. There's a passage of scripture, and today's message title was The Birthing of Patience, or Birth Patience, or per Birth Perfection, Being Perfect. There's a passage of scripture in 1 John that talks about, or maybe it's in James, I can't remember, but it talks about how that we don't just wake up and sin, right? That sin is, is kind of conceived. So for those people who have struggled with pornography, you know, you don't just like wake up and all of a sudden you're looking at the TV or the computer screen or whatever, looking at pornography. It doesn't work like that, right? There's things that happen throughout the day where your mind is not being challenged to think correctly and you're letting your mind wander and do whatever it wants. And then all of a sudden, then after one step happens and another step happens and another step happens, and another step happens, all of a sudden you're finding yourself being challenged with sin. And most sin is this way, Okay. I'll give you another example that's a little less graphic. So my children, okay? My children question my patience. They try my patience, but it doesn't happen right away. It's not with the first one. It's not even with the second one. It's not even with the third one. The problem is I have nine of them, right? That's not really a problem, only other than it's not the one, two, three, or four. It's usually by five that I'm like, okay, 
Nah. You don't just wake up in the hospital and go, how did I have the baby? I don't know. How did I get pregnant? No. You were there all along the way, right? You know what took place to get you to this point where you have a child. You know what will lead from one point to another to challenge yourself in sin. If you're constantly letting your mind to think thoughts that are incorrect, no wonder why we find ourselves then coming to a birth of a sin that's incorrect. Well, in the same way, the testing of your faith, that trials and tribulations produce something at its end when successful. The first thing, various trials will come. The second thing, this will test your faith. And the testing of that faith then produces something. Something else happens. Like, you know, when the mama bee goes to the papa bee, then something happens, right? Okay, so same kind of thing. Steadfastness happens. Any of you heard of fight or flight? Fight or flight, right? That's what happens when you're challenged with something. So there's two different responses if somebody were to stand up right now or come through that door with a gun. There's two responses that will take place. Either you will scream and run and hide, or you will run at the face of danger to protect. Fight or flight. One of the two. Guess which one Quincy does mostly? Guess which one I do with snakes? I'm fast. <laughs> the testing of your faith, there's two things you can do. You can run and you can hide or you can fight. And that fighting isn't done in your own strength, right? It's not, it's not as if you need to muster up strength within yourself in order to be a victor as you fight and strife against sin. It's the turning to Christ. It's the steadfastness that we stand unmovable on a firm foundation in Christ. And by doing this, what is produced is steadfastness. And that steadfastness, we can have that have its perfect and full effect, meaning that we are perfect, lacking in nothing. Anybody here feel like they're weak in faith sometimes? Do you? I do sometimes. I do. Like I'm not always the best Christian. I'm not always the best pastor. I don't always do the right things. I don't always, I don't always fight, right? Sometimes I, I run when I should be striving. The response that we should have then, if we want to have steadfastness, if we want to be unmovable, is the practicing of our faith in our trials and in our, tri in our tribulation that we cling to the cross and stay in him. So that this way, one happens, next happens, next happens, next happens, produces perfection in us. Weston, now that you don't have to take notes, I worry you don't listen. You're staring off into space. What were you thinking about? Now that I know that that's what happens, I'll never say that again because I want you to stay focused. Okay, here's a question, Weston. Here's my question for you. If you were to pray, Lord, give me patience. Lord, make me stronger in faith. What do you suppose would be the result of that prayer. Well, it, it, he's going to answer it for sure, but what do you think it's going to look like? Maybe, maybe. My point is this. We ask sometimes when we pray, Lord, give us patience, give us steadfastness. 
give us deeper faith. How do we get there? If it is not through trials and tribulation, are we praying for those things to come into our life when we pray these things? James takes the route of law here, right? He's telling you something to do. But this thing that he's telling you to do, the counting of all joy, the facing of your trials, and the testing of your faith, he's doing it from a place, not so that you would do this to make God happy. So my question is this. This completion, this perfection, this perfect, lacking in nothing, Weston, is this going to be justification or sanctification? You're starting over. <laughs> Whole new year. Dorothy, justification or sanctification? Sanctification. Why can't, how come you can't be more like Dorothy? Just kidding. <laughs> She, because you said, because she gets the answer second. That's why I can't. <laughs> sanctification is what it's talking about. And sanctification is the rightness before our neighbor. It's the living out of our faith. The living out of our faith cannot happen if the faith has not been first created within us. You will not have sanctification without justification. So, live out your faith. Cling to the cross. Count it to joys when various trials come. Because in these things, Christ is making us perfect in our sanctification. Christ is making and molding us in our trials and our tribulation. Every day you face stuff that is garbage, that you hate, that frustrates you, that makes you want to lose your cool, remember that in all these things, we are growing. So don't run, don't flee. Stay in the cross. Steadfastness in Christ. Be immovable. Nare I say then, flee to the cross. Hmm. Well, let us then today count it joy. I wish I could tell you exactly how to do that every time, but do it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you allow for growth, meaning that the things that are challenging us are not too much, nor will they be too little. For what comes at us has an equal amount of you granted unto us to overcome. We are never without, and as we know that you are within, every single time we know you will produce greatness. May we never lose faith. May we never lose heart. Let us wake every morning, confess what is wrong, confess our sins, cling to the cross, and challenge the devil. In your holy name, amen.
very thankful for this place of worship. And we're very thankful for the cross. We're thankful for your work that is completed. We're thankful for faith that is freely given. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those who are shut in and who could not make it today. We pray that you put your hand of healing on all of those who are in need of healing, Lord. We pray that you would lift up the council and continue to lead not only the council, but all the members of this congregation, Lord. We think of all of those young children that are in our congregation, Lord. Thank you for that young life. Thank you that you care so deeply for them and help us to be loyal unto you and loyal unto them, Lord, raising them in righteousness. Pray that you would give them a hunger and a thirst after you and your word. We pray, Lord, that you would lead this nation and its government. And I pray, Lord God, that you would be with those who serve, who fight, and even those who have died, Lord, protecting our freedoms. Be with their families, Lord, and do not let Satan have his way, but keep them close together. We pray, Lord Jesus, also for all the farmers as they begin to pick up and have a busy season, Lord. We pray for good planting, Lord. We pray for good weather. We pray for your blessing to be on each one. Lord, we lift them up to you and keep them well, keep them safe. We pray for the meeting today, Lord, uh, the quarterly meeting. Continue to lead our congregation. We also want to think of Viola this morning, Lord, and we thank you for her birthday coming up, and we just ask for your hand of healing to be on her. Be with Ken, be with Deb, and be with Bill Martin, Lord, and be with Harold, many of those, Lord, who need you greatly. We pray for the coming up events, Lord, that are coming soon. We pray for the WMF Spring Banquet. We pray that the women would be encouraged, Lord, and that they would be lifted and supported there. We pray for the National Day of Prayer, Lord. We pray that our church would make a difference in that, knowing that we're turning towards you in prayer, prayer for our nation, Lord, and for our community. We thank you for all of the work that the AFLC does. Help us to be faithful to them, Lord, as they are faithful to you. There's so many other things, Lord, we could be thankful for and pray for, but Lord, we end our time in remembering the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we will sing together our closing hymn, hymn number 571, He Hideth My Soul.
So, Brecken asked me to pray for Joyce because she's not feeling well and she wasn't here this morning. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to have Brecken pray for her. So, uh, God, Jesus, uh, please pray for uh, Joyce. She's not feeling well. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you.